and then Sai Chandramuli about the cast of identity with dignity, a study of transgender trauma. And then the next will be Luki Igohosa, anti-sexual harassment movement in Nigeria. Uh, and then Yuyun Surya, the politics of hair in Indonesia, the articulation of Papuan wo woman ethnic identity on Facebook. Because of the time constraints, so I would uh, really ask uh, to all speakers to speak about uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So that will allow us to have uh, more time for question and answer. Okay, uh, first speaker will be uh, Bidut. Okay, uh, let me read uh, her CV. bio. Yes, uh, CV. Uh, Bidut is the head of uh, Department of Women's Studies, Institute of Social Sciences uh, in New Delhi. Uh, where she pursued action uh, research on women and local self-governments in 1980s. Uh, she was the principal coordinator of IS and UNDP project on uh, capacity building of elected women leaders in local government in India of National Women's Political Empowerment Day celebrations from 1995 to 2015. So she specialists on uh, Feminine agrarian history and decentralization studies with a focus on gender, culture, and development. In a comparative perspective with India and China, she combines cross grass activism with Parsi, uh, Parsi, 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 research. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So without uh, further ado, uh, Bidu, time is yours uh, for your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Now, uh, as I was telling you that how ecological civilization is the way out to overcome the COVID, that is the context. So the, I will just read out. And the, the I have to tell me five minutes before. The COVID has created yes, an unprecedented in, uh, crisis impacting heavily on the entire population of the world in multiple ways. Within that, it, it has impacted more severely women's life and especially their life, food, and dignity. The lockdown caused sudden loss of job. Workers in unorganized sector suffered the most. With production unit closed down, workers suddenly found themselves without source of livelihood. In India, millions of migrant workers, men and women, and many with children were out on the road, desperately trying to go back to their villages. The tragedy is that the migrants experienced during this period, of course, um, unsafe transportation in unhealthy conditions have been widely documented back in the nat native places Living was hard with the scanty state assistance that most that was available. Employment facilities were meager, mainly through Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. It's a you know demand-driven scheme which allowed 200 days of work and wages. And uh, so. Uh, many of these returnees have carried the COVID infections with them and became a source of spread, causing even more health problems. Women had to carry the multiple burdens of caring for the family, performing domestic work at the household. Now that the family members spending more time at home and also find a source of earning that did not ordinarily come. Instances of domestic violence, sexual harassment, and mental breakdown increased during this period, not to speak of increased health vulnerabilities. Much of this continued even after the lockdown were over. Thus, COVID created greater social economic and political difficulties and divide among people despite 
made us that the government group. The story from India explains some major dimensions of the impact of COVID on women. And they also varied from region to region. But our panel not only presents narratives of the pandemic crisis from the women's vantage point, but Sorry, <laughs> but uh, also looks out for the pointers for alternative, which also were visible in some areas. The people in many tribal areas showed far less disruptions, saw fewer infections, and were able to carry on with the life patterns in a relatively sustained manner. Their food habits, health practices, and mode of living were different and for far more nature friendly than the urban peoples. During the recent years of the neoliberal market economy, life in cities and towns had become more, even more oriented towards high consumption and high energy life style, making it unsustainable thereby. <clears throat> In fact, scientists have pointed out that this development pattern, which has destroyed forests and natural habitat of many animals has invited virus such as COVID. We shall try to locate arenas of life pattern of tribals and indigenous people in different parts of the world that illustrated what can be called ecological economy, an economy that is fully friendly with nature and thus sustainable for the interest of the future generation. Studies in many parts of Asia, Africa, and Latin America have shown that women are the repository of traditional knowledge and still practice much of it. That can be a springboard for women's agency heralding a new pathway for global future. Therefore, a feminist agenda of formulating the elements of an ecological economy can be a biological response to the worldwide crisis that COVID pandemic has created in all. In women in panchayats have been working as frontline workers. They have risked their own lives uh, and have been working among the COVID infected migrants by informing without the availability of, about the availability of work, looking after the sanitation, shelter, food arrangement, <coughs> while they are in quarantine center. Yet, they're devoid of any power, namely three Fs, you know, fi finance, functionality, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, function. Uh, those are the funds, finance, and functionality. But they have none. Still, they're using local human and financial resources they have regenerated the local economy, which serves the needs of the people, fulfills the nutritional deficiency, and give, gives everyone, I mean, everyone gets what they, they want, and uh, they have some time, and they, they, they get job, so that there is no need to go to the city under the distress conditions. Now, uh, so, and the distribution is equal. So in this case, the, the market does not dominate, but becomes subservient of the people. In other words, women of the panchayat, asa workers, and, and anganwadi workers have become the frontline health workers and have, have helped the migrants, as I have told you. In a nutshell, 
I should argue that the women are the repository of traditional knowledge. They respect the mother earth and they try to keep balance with her by using the products given by her and uh, maintain a kind of a coexistence with nature and the humankind so that mother earth doesn't get angry. I'll just give you one example, then I'll stop. You know, this is the, I still have some time, dear. Yeah. Yes, Vidya, you still have uh, nine minutes. Okay, great. Great, I have more than that. Now, I'll just give you one example. This is the example of Mandalika. Mandalika is, you know, I mean, 12, men. Mandalika consists of 12 panchayats. It is in the state of Maharashtra in India. In India. Now, what they have done, the women of those panchayats have regenerated the bamboo products. And instead of giving it to the merchants, they themselves are using the bamboo product you know, in various ways. They sell the timber, they eat the, the bamboo shoots, and when they sell it, they get profit. The profit is shared by everybody, you know, equally. And nobody gets more, nobody gets less. So that, you know, everybody is equal and they try to, they don't go out in, uh, to the city in distress conditions. So I think if we want to get out of, in the process, they are, you know, it's, uh, they have demonstrated that Gandhiji's dream, Mahatma Gandhiji's dream of Gram Swaraj. I will explain what is Gram Swaraj. The village is the you know, the, the village decides what to use, what to, you know, in what way it should be used, the, the human and financial products, in what it should, uh, it should be used so that, you know, the mother earth is not exploited unnecessarily for the greed. You know, the development model works for the greed, whereas in this case, it is according to its your, your own need. So that you know the mother earth is not angry. So if we want to get out of this COVID, then we must exercise Gram Swaraj model. And it is not a dream, it is reality. And women have demonstrated if you practice the ecological civilization, then we can, you know, we can just, uh, uh, we will save the world. It will get destroyed. So with this, I, I will stop here. And if you have any question, I know many people don't know what is Panchayat, what is Gram Swaraj. If you ask when you, in, during the question answer hour, I will explain it to you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind consideration. Thank you, Bidhu. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting. It reminds me of uh, the notions of uh, ecovaminism, where you know women as uh, mother because uh, women is highly associated, not not highly, but always be associated with the the notions of uh, nurturing capacity. Okay, uh, next uh, we have the second uh, presenter, uh, F.R. Sulina Gultom. I think, uh, are you here, Bu uh, F.R.? Yeah, Hello? yeah, I'm here, Budi. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Bu uh, F.R. Sulina Gultom will be presenting uh, on fighting online violence against women during COVID-19 in Indonesia. Uh, do you need, uh, do you need, Oh, sorry, are you going to uh, presenting with the 
PowerPoint, Bulba? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm going to use PowerPoint. Okay, okay. You can start uh, your presentation now. You have a uh, 15 to 20 minutes for presenting. Uh, okay. Oh wait, I I need some time to share the screen because I'm using a phone right now. Okay, sure, no problem. Can Can you see my screen right now? Yeah, no, not really. It's only uh black and white, unfortunately. Oh, wait. wait, wait. Okay, uh, for those who just uh, join us, welcome to a uh, woman and gender issue session, gender and women issue session one. Uh, we have, uh, according to the program book, we have five uh, presenters today and Bijut uh, had presented on women, COVID-19 and the Panchayas, a perspective on ecological economy. Now we are waiting uh, Ibu Eva to connect uh, I think, uh, well, we have to wait for her to rejoin because I think she, she left uh, the group because she said uh, she was using her phone. Uh, maybe she need, uh, needs to change her device. Let's we do have other, other, other speaker. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, should we, okay. So, uh, the next speaker, uh, Sai Chandra Muli, and uh, I think I saw him on the screen. So, what do you think, uh, Bidu? Yeah. Should we move? To, yes, yeah. because well, I don't know. Out of okay. out of the four, okay. yeah, Eva uh, left. Maybe you know the connections. There has always be uh, the possibility of the neurological glitch. So I think uh, because Sai Chandra Muli is here, right? Uh, yeah. So, are you ready? Okay, uh, all right, uh, he'll be presenting about uh, cares for identity with dignity, study of transgender trauma. Uh, you have uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Now the time is yours. Could you please also, re uh, sorry, uh, introduce yourself, you know, where you come from and what's your research interest, something like that. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to my presentation titled The Quest for Identity with Dignity, a Study of uh, Transgender Trauma. I am Dr. T. Sai, Sai Chandramoli from Hyderabad, India. Mm. We may say central part of India. Well, um, I taught English language and literature. Subsequently, after my well into retirement, I forged into writing poetry, translation studies, cultural studies. Around 30 books I have published so far, including four books of poetry, around 19 books of uh, literary criticism, edited ones, and then translations and my own work are there. 31st book is uh, now in the press. That's a book of translation from Telugu to English, poetry. Mostly I come. Focus on poetry. Yeah. Uh, now I am into cultural studies, cultural cultural studies. Uh, I believe this is a part of it, and linguistic anthropologies also is one area in which I am interested. May I start? Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, of course, yes. 
Uh, here we find a uh, is uh, the lady standing first in the green sari is a Priya Babu, who is championing the cause of uh, transgenders with Madurai in Tamil Nadu as base. She is running one e magazine titled Trans News. They collect data, disseminate, and also they uh, share with people the accomplishments of the members of the community. In the postmodern context, socially excluded people have started moving from margins to the central. Likewise, the works they have scripted also started moving towards the center. The only problem is the mainstream literature is yet to accommodate them totally and absorb them. The voice of the others has been suppressed by most uh, narratives all these days. When they emerge from their suppressed condition to voice their issues, they are viewed as a threat to the established uh, norms. Now we find Dr. Trinetra, Dr. Trinetra Haldar, Gumarazu. She is the first transgender doctor from the state of Karnataka, or rather in the state of Karnataka. Let me quote her. She says, as a doctor now, uh, she, it is her own confessional rather statement, I quote, there was a lot of bullying and harassment that came my way, but I decided to take it head on. At one point of time in life, when you are sure of who you are, when you will not take nonsense from people, people are really intimidated by that. I enjoy it. That's the huge step forward in my life. This is what she says. If this happens to a qualified doctor, you can very well imagine what will be the condition of ordinary transgender or members of the transgender community. This part I have already read. Now, we find uh, most of the narratives of the others present their sufferings, physical and psychological, and their pathetic plight portrayed in their texts. And that actually reflects the way they live, they are being treated by the society. But the mainstream society or the literature, as I told you, is yet to accept them wholeheartedly. Writings of the others, by the others, on the others, revisit the grand narratives to identify their position and question the popular narratives for their portrayal of them as a weak people. Weak in what sense? Weak in what sense? That's the question. Now, the transgenders often are neglected by the mainstream. They live in ghettos as a result. And they have, or rather they had a glorious past and references have been there in the past, uh, say in the works of art like uh, mythologies, epics, and then um, uh, Puran, Puranas. For example, in Ramayana, uh, when Rama goes on exile, all the people of Ayodhya follow him to the forest. He tells them, all men, women, and children go back to Ayodhya and wait for me. At the end of period of exile in the forest, I will return. You need not stay in the forest. And then he goes on his way. The rest is the story we all know. But to his surprise, when he comes back to the same place after his period of exile of 14 years, after killing Ravana, he finds the hijdas standing there as it is. He asks them, what happened? Why are you still here? Oh, Lord Rama, you asked men, women, and children to go back. What about us? You did not mention us. So we have chosen to, or rather we chose to stay here. Moved by their devotion, 
moved by their dedication. He bestowed on them the power of benediction, and they are known for the same even today. As you know, in most parts of India, when a young child is born, and if it happens to be a boy, celebrations are there. Hichdas are invited. I sh I'm sorry for using that word. Transgender people are invited then. They are being felicitated. They are given gifts. They are given cash as a sort of reward for their blessings showered on the family. Now, there are uh, references to the transgenders in Mahabharata also. The characters of Shikandi and Brihanala are very well known to all of us. And all the Hindu mythologists, people who are familiar with Hindu epics and mythologists come across such characters. In the Bible also, there are several references to them. Critics across the globe have been condemning the British Raj for, the, for criminalizing the sexuality of Hijras through a Criminal Tribes Act of the year 1871. After many years of struggle and suffering, they have been accorded the term transgender as a label to refer to them. In fact, the third genders are referred by many names across the country, like India. In Tamil, they are called Aravani, Kiruvannangai, Kinnari, Koti, etc. In Telugu, they are called Koyodu, Chakka, and then Kujja, in Hindi, hijda, and then, as you know, in English, eunuch is the term used. But transgender activists like uh, Asha Bharati uh, refuse to call them eunuchs because uh, the word eunuchs literally means uh, castrated males. She further argues that transgender people are not castrated males. They have become females through the act of nirvana and possess feminine sensibilities. It is worthy to note that there are nearly 5 million transgender people moving from one place to another place in search of a livelihood. Now, this is a, a lady, or rather a transgender person, who wants to impress on the society and the people with the way she wants to be accepted as an individual. This is the way she wants to dress herself and present herself before the society. Transition refers to the process of changing the one, the way one looks or dress, dresses and how people see and treat them as individuals. They are always referred to as a deviant people. Yes, they are deviant in a way. They don't question or they don't, uh, uh, what should I say, find fault with it. They have a different personality. They have a different psyche. They have a different orientation as such. Medical treatment uh, transition can be handled in two ways, through medical or social agents. Medical treatment is uh, handled by experts in the field through uh, offering uh, hormones, hormone replacement theory, as you call it, or also resorting to surgical procedures. Social transition encompasses acquiring a new name, change in dress as we find here, joining friends and family members as a person wants with a new identity. This is the way they want to look. Pride March in the US, as you know, June is celebrated as a month of pride in memory of Stonewall Uprise and subsequent amelioration in the living conditions of transgender communities. It's a month of celebration of pride in their identity and rights as individuals they got after fighting for a long period. LGBT studies have acquired respectability and queer literature is much respected and accepted area of study today across the globe. Now, Parliament of India has passed Transgender Persons Protection Act, or Protection of Rights Act, 
in the year 2019 in the month of November. After over a year, the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment has allocated them 500 crores of rupees for initiate launching uh, and taking care of welfare measures aimed at helping their conditions. Uh, the, this money is to be spent, spent at the rate of 100 crores per year over a span of five year period. This plan aims at welfare of the transgender community by providing student scholarships, skilling programs to provide the livelihood opportunities to all the members as far as possible. The plan also includes uh, uh, setting up welfare homes and health initiatives and many more. Until then, to identify them or to give them a respectable sort of place in the society, the government has uh, offered to, or the government has started the initiative to give identity cards to each member of the community. We just uh, came across this slide earlier, but here I would like to talk about what R. Subramaniam, Secretary of Social Justice and Empowerment Department, has said. I quote, there are five key areas identified in the Act for Transgender Persons. These include initiatives of health, social wealth, education, accommodation, skilling, etc. The government is working towards implementing the initiatives and the government also wants to make all the states in India part of the stakeholders so that in consultation with them, they want to finalize uh, the strategies to handle the issue and do justice to the weaker sections, particularly the transgender community because of the discrimination to which they are subjected to through the centuries. Now we find uh, transgenders stepping into different arenas of activity. We find the transgender models uh, taking the ramp by storm. Here we find Nakshatra Jyoti from Madurai. She says, I quote, gender difference cannot dissolve my dreams, unquote. What a beautiful aim, aspiration, inspiration to members of the community, you see. Gender difference cannot dissolve my dreams. Uh, uh, she is a, uh, what should I say, uh, master of, uh, she passed uh, master of computer sciences. She is an accomplished Bharatanatyam dancer. From childhood, she developed interest in dancing. And now she is uh, trying to crack a Tamil Nadu public service commission exams. So hope, uh, hopefully she will be successful and be getting an officer's job. In her own words, she says, Getting into a profession to serve the society is my aim, but my real passion is modeling, through which I try to impress upon the people what I am, what I should be looked at like. This is what enjoy, I enjoy doing. Now, transgender people set a high benchmark in a, uh, modeling industry recently. They elevate India's stature in international duties. Here you find a few members of the community who have triumphed on the ramp and have been crowned with success. Now, let me introduce you, Veena Sindre, Miss Veena Sindre, the most accomplished lady. She is a pioneer in modeling from the transgender section. She was born and recognized as a boy at the time of her birth. But as she was growing up, she developed a distaste to be associated with boys. She did not enjoy playing with the boys. By the time she reached her 12th year, she declared that she's a girl and she would like to play with the girls. And she doesn't want to be, well, she doesn't enjoy the company of boys. This invited sneers and jeers from her own family members, her own family, uh, I mean, the circle of relatives, etc. The swag and the walk was uh, ridiculed. I can, but she made it uh, a plus point. The swag and walk, which was ridiculed by them, was made a plus point 
Today, she is queen on the ramp. She is queen among the models. In catwalk, as you call it at times in general parklands, no derision intended here. Uh, in catwalk or ramp walk, you find her winning uh, laurels in many contests, wherever she took. It can be Bombay, or it can be Lucknow, or it can be Bengaluru. The crowning moment came when she was declared as a Miss Trans Queen in the year 2018. Her life or her uh, career shows nothing is impossible if there is a, a resolute mind, if there, are, there is a persistence, if one pursues one's passions, uh, uh, what should I say, with dedication and seriousness. No. May I introduce you to Padmini Prakash. She is the first transgender news reader in India. She took up this job, or rather she joined profession on August 15th in the year 2014. She says August 15th is a Independence Day for India. It also augured well for her because that was the day she got real independence and established her credentials as an individual on a par with the other members uh, of the uh, other members in the society, other members of the other genders in the society, because these people are called transgenders and third gender people. She says that was the proudest moment in my life. May I say that uh, she is married to Prakash, the gentleman is Prakash. She is married to Prakash, who was her uh, childhood friend, who was uh, visiting her family quite often as a close member of the family circle. And uh, when her own family disowned her, when her own uh, relatives, her own people distanced themselves this gentleman came forward, extended his hand, held her hand firmly, reinforcing her resolution, reinforcing her determination, and rekindling her hope that she can be on her own feet as an individual, even though her own family has disowned and distanced her. She is married to him. They are a complete family now, because you find a child by in there among them. The boy is Jayasri, they're adopted by them. She adopted the boy Jayasri there. Now she says, my family is complete. And she also says, life is so beautiful. I am overcome with the overwhelmed with satisfaction. My contentment is absolute. I'm happy with what I have achieved in life. Now, May I tell you that uh, transgender members are uh, making... Sorry for interruption, How Dr. Much time, how much yes, time we have only one more minute, sorry. Fine, fine, fine. fine. One more minute, yes, thank yeah. you. Transgender members are learning yoga and they are trying to become masters of yoga also, yoga teachers also. Now, Transgender News is a web menu magazine brought out in Tamil and English initially. It will be spreading into other languages. It will be spreading to other states and it will be brought out in other languages of India. Transgender people have proved themselves by smashing all misnomers created about them and spread about them. Uh, the, they don't need anyone's sympathy, let me tell you. They don't need anybody's sympathy. A word of support, a guest gesture of encouragement to brighten lives uh, help them immensely. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Chandra Moli from Ayyadarabad, India. Uh, he's also a fellow of Royal Asiatic Society uh, in Great Britain and Ireland with a lot of publication. Uh, he's also a poet, uh, translator, and also a critic. Next, uh, because uh, Pueva uh, previously, uh, I don't know, ha had some problems with the connections. So I think, uh, the next presentation is from uh, Eva Solina Kultom, a lecturer of English literature. Uh, her, her presentation will be about fighting online violence against women during COVID-19 in Indonesia. Whoever, you have 15 to 20 minutes of uh, presentation. Uh, time is um, yours. 
Oke, okay, thank you, Budia. Budia Putri. Uh, hello, can you see hello, my screen yes. now? Yeah. No, no, not yet, not yet. Okay, uh, can you locate the share screen? Uh, yeah. Sorry. Share screen. Hello, Bu Eva, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. I'm still operating my phone. Oh, uh, Budia, can I can I um, send you the, my PowerPoint to you? Uh, let me see. Let me send it. Okay, to yes, 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 yes. Oh, okay, you can send it in chat. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, oh, by see. the way, while I'm doing it, uh, you, you may skip to another presenter. Okay, all right, all right okay, then. Thank okay. You, thank you, Budia. Okay, okay. Uh, all right, thank you, Bu Eva. Uh, uh, Eva is still having problem with the connection because she's using uh, mobile. Uh, so the next uh, presenter is Luki Igohosa Ukbudian, uh, anti-sexual har harassment movement in Nigeria. Are you here, uh, Lucky? I don't see any names, uh, any names on Lucky uh, Ukbudian. Okay, so probably we move to the next uh, presenter, Yuyun Surya, because I saw uh, Bu Yuyun uh, from the beginning. Uh, Bu Yuyun, uh, let me read your bio because uh, you have, I have downloaded all the abstract here. Uh, Thank Bu you, Yuyun Bu currently, uh, Yuyun Surya, is currently a lecturer and researcher in Communication Department, Faculty of Social and Political Sciences, Universitas Erlangga, uh, Indonesia. Uh, she works a lot of on uh, media and also gender issue. And her presentation is about the politics of hair in Indonesia, the articulation of Papuan women ethnic identity on Facebook, uh, it talks about uh, the pose of Papuan women uh, indicating the ideal Papuan women in terms of their skin color and hair. So you have uh, 20 minutes uh, for you, Yun. And beauty also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Budia. I'm going to start. I'm going to uh, start the screen now. Hopefully it works. Have you seen my... Um... Yes, we can oh, see now. now. Okay. Yes, yes, okay, yes. Right. We can see now. All right. So um, my presentation, mm -hmm. uh, it's about the politics of air the articulation of Papuan woman ethnic identity on Facebook. Um, thank you for introducing me, Budia. I uh, would like to uh, start my presentation uh, by talking about what is ethnic identity and the interplay between ethnic identity when it's articulated on social media. The next one will be, I'm going to talk about um, why Papua, why is it interesting to talk about ethnic identity of Papuans in relations to Indonesia. And the next one will be uh, uh, about the focus of my uh, paper here. Uh, the one of the Facebook group in, um, in Facebook account called Orang Asli Papua or the Papuan people and the way the post uh, that contains women and in particular their physical appearance and the hair that kind of like um, related to the uh, political um, resistance happened in Papua uh, that aims to um, separate the Papua from Indonesia. So let me start. Um, 
So what is actually ethnic identity? Ethnic identity defines as how individuals interpret and understand their ethnic identity through self-identification or labels, a feeling of belonging and an attitude toward other groups. It is determined by the individual's perception of its meaning within a specific social context. It involves both identity announcement made by the individual claiming the identity and identity placement made by others who endorse the claim identity. This ethnic identity can be best understood as both depending on individual interpretation and on the results of social construction. Um, social media like Facebook offers wider opportunities for identity to be explored. Miller argues that it gives a moral encompassment within which we have a sense of not only who we are, but also who we ought to be. Facebook, as one of the social media platforms, provides users with the ability to perform activities such as status updates, to express preferences, and to also connect with others. It provides an ideal environment for the expression of the hope for the possible self, a realistic, socially desirable identity an individual would like to establish given the right circumstances. On Facebook, furthermore, the construction of identities are embedded in social interaction such as expression of opinions and liking and sharing a post. These activities can be considered as self-recognition and acknowledgement of others. Now, when we are talking about Papua, Papua is um, here the um, map of Indonesia. And as you see that, uh, this is the uh, Papua that I'm talking about. So a bit uh, historical background of why I am interested in Papua and why uh, my focus is on uh, ethnic identity of Papua. Papua is one of the Indonesian regions where ethno-based movement has been on, on the rise. The island of Papua is located in the easternmost part of Indonesia and comprises most of the western half of New Guinea. It is Indonesia's largest province with a low population density compared to other provinces in Indonesia. During Indonesia's struggle for independence in 1945 to 1949, nationalists insisted that all territories previously administered by the Netherlands East Indies should be included in the sovereignty transferred to Indonesia. The Dutch, however, insisted that Papua be exempt from the final settlement because Papuans were ethnically and culturally distinct from Indonesians. The Indonesian government disagreed and they view Dutch support for Papuan self-determination as a way for the Dutch to retain colonial influence in the Pacific. So most of Indonesians are, you know, um, have lighter skin, uh, but Papua is considered as um, belongs to Melanesian race. So it's kind of like have darker skin and also uh, more curlier hair. Ultimately, the Indonesians prevailed under the New York Agreement and the 1969 Act of Free Choice supervised by the United Nations. Papua's status as part of Indonesia was ratified by international community. The result of the Act of Free Choice is manipulative and the Indonesian government considered as betrayed Papuan's rights. Papuan leaders were excluded from these negotiations and therefore had no say in the transfer of their homeland from the Dutch to Indonesia. This lack of consultation over Papua's annexation has set the stage for years of unrest in the region up till now. The Indonesian government views the expression of Papuan identity as subversive and treats it with significant suspicion and concern. The Indonesian government continues to marginalize Papuans, to exploit their natural resources, and to use a security approach to handle the resistance. Papuans are denied freedom of expression and sovereignty and are unable to represent their cultural and political interests. And social media, of course, become the viable means for Papuans to express their distinct ethnic identity and political struggle. So my focus is, again, uh, my focus in this study is to look at one of the uh, Papuan group on Facebook called Orang Papua or Orang Asli Papua. It is a closed group and it has like over 80 million members. So it is the biggest uh, compared to other um, Facebook group. Um, 
what what is interesting is that is that the way they uh, post and express uh, their ethnic identity. This is the example of the uh, post that uh, have uh, that frequently posted in um, Orang Papua group. As you may as you may see that most of them are um, emphasizes on their um, physiognomy. Um, um, appearances or physical appearances. So members of the Orang Paupa group frequently label themselves as having black skin and curly hair as shown in post in that figure and make their distinct skin and hair visually prominent. The figures in this post were captured in close, uh, close up shots and app at showing details. In this regard, this post aim at showing the distinct physical appearance details of the figure, the skin and hair characteristics with short verbal messages such as I am Papuan or black skin, curly hair that is Papuan and visual images are the focus of the post compared to verbal messages. Through these visual images, they try to convince other members of the group that their physiognomy is closer to Melanesian than Indonesian. And what is most important thing is that um, compared to their fellow uh, male Papuans, when uh, Papuan women post their um, um, images, visual, visual images in uh, this uh, group, uh, what's interesting is that the way uh, the comments from other members uh, um, toward this post, as you can see that in here, uh, the comment is kind of like, you know, um, it's, uh, it's different. So for instance, um, when um, one of the posts in here um, uh, showing uh, um, Papuan woman, they say that awesome Miss Papuan Melanesian, sweet, cool, Papuan woman is sweet and cool, uh, sweet smile, she's so cute, you are so beautiful, etc. And again, posts containing black skin and curly hair receive supportive, supportive comments, such as awesome Miss Papuan Melanesian or I am Papuan too. And these comments contribute to the way identity is constructed on social media because they are considered as endorsement to the asserted identity. As argued by Zhao, in regard to the construction of ethnic identity online, posts function as an identity announcement and the comments like and likes act as the identity endorsement. In this respect, the comment function lets member of the group develop the narrative of Papuan identity. Faxkes states that identity on social media is constructed and presented when users give opinions through posts and comments. Now, what is more interesting is that uh, the other post that I found in here is it says um, the way uh, one uh, the, the author um, suggest how to find Papuan's authentic or true identity. Um, um, the uh, author post um, female uh, images um, and the caption said that this is, this is the illustration of non-Papuan uh, and the next one, the male uh, images, the, the male image um, with the caption identity of um, the authentic Papua or the true identity of Papuan. So what is actually um, implied in this post? This post, I think, um, um, emphasizes on the authentic or ideal Papuans, the need to preserve Papuans identity, particularly for young Papuans, is by retaining their physical appearance. The hair straightened trend uh, just like when, uh, just like it shows in the post, uh, has made Papuans similar to Indonesians, which you know, like it, it is not really part. Uh, it is really part of their um, what political um, goal is trying to uh, separate it from Indonesia. That's why they really expect uh, to have a different identity from Indonesians, uh, especially Javanese, whereas Papuans should be different from Indonesians. The depiction of women to represent non-Papuan identity related, relates to the context in which lighter skin and straight hair have become the standard of beauty perpetuated through the media in Indonesia. 
um, in their study, Prabhas Moro and Saraswati uh, found out that skin lightening in Indonesian women magazines suggests that light-skinned women embody ideal beauty in Indonesia, and it is construed at, as cosmopolitan. And within a wider context, in an African-American context, for example, Lester argues that hair is a continuous subject to racial and gender biases within and outside Black cultural perception. Hair redefines collective identity and ideals of beauty in an African-American context. Thus, hair is placed in complex realities of social, historical, and political relations. The politics of hair, as I quoted from Lester, in the African and American context is somewhat similar to the Papuan context. The ideal Papuan is placed within the struggle to contrast themselves to Indonesians. Yet straight hair and lighter skin still embody ideal beauty. Thus the post indicates that the ideal Papuan should be dissimilar to Indonesian slight skin and straight hair and lightening skin and straightening hair in the Papuan context signal a loss of primordial and therefore politically assertive identity. And in this sense, the use of women kind of like um, emphasizes that most of the, um, you know, uh, Papuan who kind of like intend to be similar to Indonesian um, uh, in terms of the beauty standard by straightening their hair and also make the uh, skin lighter. I think that's it um, for my presentation. Budia, I'm going to um, uh, post. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm going to uh, stop chefs. Yes, yeah. thank you very much, Budia. Thank you uh, very much, Bu Yuyun. Uh, it's very interesting uh, presentation. So far, we have uh, three very, very interesting presentations of how women make sense of their lives, you know, with Bidut's uh, uh, grassroots women and how they are familiar to what we call it now, if we can categorize them now as the uh, women who are concerned with the notion of eco feminisms, and then from Dr. Chandra Moli, uh, the transgenderism in India, uh, the way that, you know, uh, transgender is more and more accepted. And in Indonesia, especially in uh, ethnic, uh, in, 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 in Sulawesi, in uh, Celebs, in the island of Celeb, uh, there is an ethnic, uh, the Bugis ethnic, that they recognize uh, five genders. So you have male, female, uh, masculine, feminine, and then chalala, chalabai, fake male and fake female, and then the uh, basu uh, or bisu, the nor, nor female and nor women. So it's probably similar to uh, yes. transgender. Is it, uh, if I'm mistaken, I watch a documentary called The Hijra. Oh, yeah, the hijra, yeah. Yeah, the hijra in India. So I think that's very interesting. And even in the, uh, before the colonization, during the kingdom of Indonesia, uh, of Nusantara, uh, there, is, there is still now a statue that half male, half female. In, in, in Yes, yes. It's very, very interesting. So I guess uh, we have... Uh, a lot of things in common, you know, women in India and uh, Indonesia as well. Now we come to a presentation from Eva Kultom. Are you ready, Bu Eva? Yes, yes, Budia. I, I'm sorry, I cannot open your file because I think it's corrupted, uh, some some sort of virus. So I've, I've, I receive it, I can download it, but I could not open it. I'm oh, okay. Is it possible for me to present without any PowerPoint? Yes, yes, yes. You can read okay. it. Your presentation is okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, you so, have, uh, uh, yeah, 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, good, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. And um, today, my topic is about 
So I'll, I'm, I'm really sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, let me introduce my name. I am Eva Gultom from uh, Syllabus Island, Haloleole University. And my topic today is about uh, fighting online violence against women during COVID-19 in Indonesia. Okay, so um, uh, since the government, especially Indonesian government implemented a PSBB or a local or social uh, local social restriction, it has imposed a tendency on using digital technology uh, has been increasing. So according to the Indonesian Internet Service Providers Association, the number of internet users in Indonesia has increased to 73.7% of population or 7 million users. And then the growth of these internet users unwittingly has put the position of women at serious risk as to the part of the internet users. And surprisingly, a recent study exposed the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on gender inequality that underlies cases of violence against women. Um, moreover, the new habit uh, has added more problems to the prevalence of sexual and gender-based violence, either in real time or in the cyber world until today. Women as the highest victims are assumed to have the potentials to suffer cyber harassment. Uh, the lack of online experience and appropriate skills urge women who have less access to the internet are at a higher risk for any digital sexual harassment or cyber violence. Okay, and then um, actually I want to show like a data, but, but I'm really sorry I cannot show it to you. So uh, the data is about, the data is about, um, the report of sexual violence towards women in Indonesia from January until May uh, 2020. So um, from the diagram and the table um, showed that the most reported cases of sexual violence are online gender-based violence, which both committed by uh, known and unknown people. Um, they have tendency to threat uh, of uh, spreading, sending, or showing photos on, and videos with sexual nuances, exhibitionism, and sexual digital exploitations. And then the deliverance of this action is in the form of sexual images or video via direct messages to victims, such as Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or um, WhatsApp. And then uh, they, they aim um, so that the perpetrators that mostly uses a big account. Okay, so um, as a result, the victims are disturbed by uh, fear and then they hesitate to bring the case to the law process as the culture of the blaming victims is still common or in our, in our society. So uh, basically the victims of uh, KBGO or online, um, yeah, uh, harassment, they don't want to report them to the law or police or any um, related institution because um, they're very afraid of their identity because it, it is like humiliating yourself in front of uh, the public. And okay, so to to overcome these problems, it is important for us to have like a social media literacy. And then uh, technology, uh, technology um, can be perceived as not only limited as a tool or device, but also a system that shapes uh, mindsets and patterns of social relation. Uh, social media literacy is urgent as it enables people to understand their own action in using the social media wisely, such as tweeting, posting status, photos, or videos, which may invite different reactions from other users. And according to the National Commission on Women's Protection, 
uh, the increase of violence against women doesn't not um, I mean doesn't only occur in the real world but also in cyberspace. Um, okay, next, um, why online violence uh, towards women must must be stopped because most of the victims they have lost uh, psychological. So um, most of the victims they have tendency to suicide or even um, or even to withdraw them themselves from the society. And then um, we have like social inclusion and ex and exception cases, which is uh, the victims of this uh, harassment. Um, they don't want to be together with with their uh, environment or are their uh, even family members because uh, they they feel shocked and then uh, they chose to to being solitude from 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 the public. And then uh, the third one is about a uh, loss economic. So um, they realize it or not, most of the victims, um, they, they chose not to continue their work uh, just because they don't want to be a subject or, or an object of the humanization itself. And then the second, and then the, the next is about um, the limited mobility. They, they cannot uh, move freely because, because they, they are afraid uh, to, to getting online or offline or, or being together with, with, um, with public, that one. And then the last, uh, internet has manipulated uh, the victims. And then um, just because they most most mostly women, just because they, they are lack of uh, knowledge to to have like a me, social media literacy, uh, they chose to stop it and then try to to be secluded. Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for the time. Yeah, that's all for my presentation today. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Eva, or Mbak Eva. Uh, I think uh, the next present presenter will be uh, Luki Igohosa Opudian. Uh, is it here? Is he or she here? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to locate the name here. So I guess we only have one, two, three, four, uh, presenters that already presented their uh, papers and uh, it's really really interesting and uh, looking at the diversity of hope women uh, in real life uh, and also in uh, virtual life because especially for the younger generations today uh, most probably virtual life is more important than real life because they are online uh, like 24 seven, you know, the uh, living life online become much more important than uh, real life, like friendship. And I think in, in this uh, pandemic time, uh, virtual life become something that we cannot really uh, live because, you know, with the, with the pandemic, with the restriction of uh, travel and everything. Okay, now we have uh, almost uh, 50 minutes for question and answer. Uh, I would like to uh, open this session. If you have question, uh, you can ask directly and uh, refer your questions to the presenters. Anybody? Any questions? Okay, please, Usa, Usa Chandran. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's, it's been a wonderful session for all the gender scholars, I'm sure this is a treat. And uh, thank you, I, I would especially like to thank uh, Professor uh, Vidyut Mahanti for invite, for actually giving me this opportunity to attend this. I had no idea about this wonderful uh, uh, session, especially on gender. So my question is, I mean, I'm really fascinated by three, uh, all the presentations, but my question is particularly to the identity, uh, the issue of identity that, uh, uh, um, that, uh, uh, Professor Chandra Molly and Surya, 
Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Usha. Yeah. So uh, about the fact that I think there's a constant struggle being there's a constant struggle between um, you know uh, how one would like to identify oneself when others are watching you. Uh, you have a certain like uh, Surya also mentioned about the hair color and the face, uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, the skin color, and uh, also uh, Professor Chandramoli also mentioned about how. Uh, transgender would like to present themselves so how they would like to identify themselves how people would like to how they would like people to look at them and also how uh, people would uh, people have already created these identities and you have to fill in the, into that boxes so my question is isn't it a constant struggle isn't it the former always in, influenced by the later so um, so it's uh, yeah. So it's just some discussion which I would like you to uh, give your views on. Thank you. Okay, uh, your question is uh, addressed uh, addressed to Dr. Chandramuli and Dr. Yuyun Surya. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Just one minute. Yes. Yes. Just there. Uh, yes. Yes. We did. Yes. Let us take all the questions. Okay, okay. And then we can address and let us, uh, later on we can comment in overall yes. comment. Our part. Sure. sure, sure, no problem. Okay, any other questions? They're all satisfied, it seems. <laughs> now, yeah, I think uh, now it's time for the presenters to answer the questions. Neep, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, we can be, please, uh, be yeah. my guest, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Good, af good afternoon, friend. Uh, my question addressed to Pitya. Yeah, this is a bit, uh, very interesting. Who, so, sorry, we can be, your, your voice is breaking yeah. out, yes? Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, who Hello. are you addressing Hi. your questions? Okay, okay. My name is Kathy Sukesi. I'm from uh, Indonesia, uh, uh, especially uh, Brawijaya University. <laughs> I'm from Indonesia. Yeah, I'm from Indonesia. Sorry. Thank you. My question addressed to with you. Yeah, with a very interesting okay. issues yeah. about the uh, gender, COVID crisis, and environment. Yes. And we know that the impact of COVID-19 uh, in Indonesia, might be especially, is different between a uh, rural environment and urban environment. Yeah. Uh, the, and then the community from rural and urban is have the uh, different perception about the uh, COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask you, maybe uh, you can tell me about the, uh, the impact uh, in rural and urban with the actual community and uh, urban community in India, please. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, uh, let us okay. collect thank you. questions. Then we'll, I will yes. ask. Yeah. Okay, uh, one more questions before uh, all presenters can uh, answer the questions. Yeah. Please, uh, we will provoke them. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, now uh, probably presenters can answer the question. We start with you, Bijut, and then uh, Dr. Chandra Muli, Dr. Yeah. Yun Surya, and also uh, Dr. Eva Kultom. Please. Right. All right. Okay. So, I mean, uh, I was glad that you asked about the impact of COVID between rural community and urban community. I will straight take you to tribal area. You imagine the tribes of your, your country. They are immune to COVID, particularly those who don't go out. Of course, those who go out for a dadan labor. Nowadays, people are going out a dadan labor. Dadan labor means the contractor just gives them some advance and takes them to clean factory. So they catch COVID. But, but there are tribes, those who don't go out and they're isolated. They're immune to COVID. 
particularly, you know, I mean, there are certain regions of my state, Odisha, which is in the eastern part of India. And Professor Mauli, Chandra Mauli knows about it. He is next state. So they are immune to COVID. Why? Because they make a you know, balance with the nature. They have regenerated the forest. And the forest yields, rather mother earth, nature yields plenty of healthy fruits, then products which can be sold or fulfill the needs of the local people. In fact, the villagers, I talked about the Mendaleka experiment, which is experiencing the Gram Swaraj. Gram Swaraj is a beautiful concept of Gandhiji. The villagers mm -hmm. decide how to develop by using the human and natural resources. In this mm -hmm. case, the market doesn't dominate. The market is subservient to the needs of the villagers. So, mm -hmm. and in fact, COVID is the result of market-oriented, market-driven growth. Mm -hmm. You know, China in one, COVID came, and then some one woman ate from the, uh, you know, restaurants, and she picked up the COVID, and she migrated to America and all that. Now WHO is investigating origin of uh, the COVID in one in China. So if you analyze the pattern, life pattern of tribals, particularly tribals and primitive tribals, you will see how they respect the mother earth. You know, whatever the, the mother earth gives, they are satisfied with it. And they use the indigenous heart to you know heal themselves and they uh, they don't get infectious diseases until they come in contact with the foreigners in contrast the urban locales are very unsafe they live particularly the slum area people in slum uh -huh. area they live yeah. in very unhealthy conditions Mm -hmm. Of course, there is a big cluster in Mumbai called Dharabi. Mm -hmm. Now, they, they have managed the thing so well that COVID hasn't touched them. But otherwise, in other places, you know, the sexual violence, the transgender problems, everything is there. So it is very different urban yeah. environment. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, if you want to know more about Mendaleka experiment, so mm. you just Google it or I will talk to you, you know, you send me your email, I'll write about Mendaleka experiment. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful experiment and you can replicate whatever the conducive conditions are there. Thank you. I hope you are satisfied. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Vijit. Thank you. Uh, now, probably uh, the second speaker, uh, Dr. Chandra Muli. Yes. Am I audible? Right. Well, this is uh, basically an identity based uh, question. And uh, as we know, human beings are basically interested in their own identities. After all, our life itself is identity based. And uh, I am particularly happy because in this panel and on the screen, I'm able to find friends from India and Indonesia. I am well connected with Indonesia. I had been to Medan, Kalimantan, Bali, Java, like Surabaya, Jogja. It's a, my second home, I should say. It's my second home. I'm so happy so many friends from Indonesia are here. Uh, well, we have a shared culture. We have a shared culture. As such, many things what we notice here can be seen there also with a little variation. Now, coming to this identity of transgenders, uh, uh, I think the uh, has already given some information about elephant. Other places, 
how it's been handled. Well, in India also, they are slowly coming into the mainstream and they are offered jobs in railways, in uh, transport department, and in different places. As such, they are not discriminated. Uh, I can also give you an example that a person who was known as a Mr. So-and-so a few years ago, maybe five, six years ago, only in the software company, is known as a Miss So-and-so. So he has undergone this a transformation uh, completely, successfully, 100%. And the company has made it mandatory that all the members, whether executives or staff, should address her as a Miss So-and-so on the Sophia. I should not reveal all the names, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The example only I'm giving. You should not call him with his former name, but you should treat him and with the dignity and call him with the name he has acquired and he is proud of. So it's basically identity based. Whether I translate or give a lecture in a conference or write a poem and publish, it's all just to establish my own feelings, share my feelings and establish my identity, is it not? Are we all not conscious of our own identity? Yes, we are. But one thing is, if this is not acceptable or sneered upon by others, then the struggle starts. Then the anxiety begins. Then the agitation keeps a person perturbed, disturbed. So unless this is settled, solved, to the satisfaction of the individual perfectly. This can, I mean, the struggle continues. I just gave you a few examples of successful people. Apart from this, there are so many unsuccessful people. And uh, we call them as hitch does no, they clap. That is a mark of identity, no? They clap loudly when they come for uh, asking for arms or when they go to, to um, from one shop to another shop to collect money, they clap. That is a mark of their identity. Just as I have shown the pictures of the people, uh, the way they want to be accepted as, this clap is one gesture. It is one gesture. So the person establishes identity in different manners. And uh, I just only touch a few points apart. There's a lot to be done. And only when these people get into the mainstream 100% and are not discriminated against, then only proper justice is done to the members of the community. Very good. Thank you, I, thank I, you. What I'm no, trying yeah, to say yeah, is, you... just one minute, one minute. What yeah, I'm sure. trying to say is superstitions associated with the community are about the community right. and the kind of uh, thinking along the earlier path or antiquated paths is no longer visible, no longer discernible. There is a total change in the outlook of the society. There is a total change among the people also. As such, the transgenders have got a great uh, uh, future to enjoy their life. They have bright places, I mean, good places to occupy too. Yeah. Even Arjun, Arjun became Brihanala. Brihanala. Yes, yes, right. yes. 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 Thank you. I did Dia, Dia also would know. Yes. Yes. Thank you, uh, Chandra. Uh, Yuyun, you have anything to say about this uh, identity? Yes. Especially I online. Wanna, <laughs> yes. I just want to add what uh, Dr. Chandra uh, has already minute. explained. That. May I say oh, one Sorry. Minute. Yeah, sure. Yes. In Pramanan, when I went to Pramanan, there were some temples, as you know, Hindu temples. I'm just wondering whether there is a sculpture of Ardhanarishwara there. I have seen the sculpture, I mean, uh, idols of uh, Ganesha and then Subramanya and also Kankadurga and Shiva, Vishnu. Mm. Ardhanarishwara, I was not very sure whether I could see there or not in Pramanan. Ardhanarishwara is very unique. I think Indonesia must be having. Yeah. Ardhanarishwara. Yes, yes, yes. That Shiva. 
Iya, iya. Oke. Oke. thank you. Uh, Yuyun, do you have something to say about this? Yes, about I guess um, yes, I guess um, the issue of identity. I think it's um, a never-ending process. It's not a being but a becoming process. So we are all really living in a modern society. We always like um, have an evolution with plenty of social groups and um in that sense we always have like the, you know developing our identity trying to adjust or trying to you know um make some um additional things about identity and when it comes to social media of course social media become one of the affiliation nowadays um um to our identity um all of the online users i guess Um, in terms of identity, trying to seek for the acknowledgement of their claims, for instance, through uh, the likes that they receive when they post something, through the comments that they receive from their post in their uh, social media account accounts. I guess this is the, well, uh, the kind of the uh, new process of identity um, creation in online media. We really try to claim ourselves to the post that we have Uh, or that we post in um, our social media account and we have the acknowledgement from others through the likes, through the shares, through the comments that uh, we receive. And somehow um, we're, we are really looking for that, you know. Um, we're not only looking for um, things that um, enjoy it, but, but also um, things that might um, maybe like the, a, a, a negative response that kind of like really... Um, affect the way we see ourselves when it comes to the use of social media. I think uh, that's all that I would like to add in the regard of the identity on social media, Budia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eva, do you have any comment on uh, social media and identity of the users of the social media? Especially because, uh, well, uh, what I'm thinking is that Uh, especially in Indonesia, in many cases, uh, technology is not for everybody, you know, like, especially uh, the Internet of Thing is exclusively reserved for those who have access. Uh, I remember did you talk about women in the rural area in Indonesia. Uh, internet is a luxury for them. Many of them simply could not access the uh, technology. So there is yes. always be a debate uh, about the elitism of uh, technology. Uh, and then because Eva was talking about uh, the sexual harassment online, right? So I was just wondering if it's also uh, this is associated with the idea of elitism because I, I, every uh, harassment is harassment, right? Virtually or uh, in reality. But then again, uh, In one hand, uh, technology is not accessible for everybody, especially uh, for women in the rural area. So, uh, what do you think, uh, Eva, about you know identity online in relations to the uh, harassment that posted by the women as victims on uh, uh, social media, especially on a uh, digital platform? Dia, dia. Yes, Musa uh, still has a question for her mm -hmm. to address. Okay, okay. Usa, usa, yes, uh, Eva, what, what do you think? Hello, well, Eva. Uh, I, I do I do agree with with uh, what the speaker said about uh, identity of women nowadays, because uh, being realized or not, our position as women is still fragile. Um, if if we are if you are living in a big city, it's okay. Then the social media literacy uh, will be gotten by us. However, it will be different situation for women who live in a in a um, solitary or or well a small city. Uh, I don't believe that they will get the same access like like what we got uh, today 
and then um, if if you still remember um, the the case that that uh, one of the most popular actress in Indonesia, uh, the actress uh, actually even though she she um, she became uh, one of the one of the what um, the player at at the video like a sexual video, but um, she's still a victim because um, unknown people unknown people has distributed her her naked videos uh, to the public and it is very dangerous for us nowadays and uh, i guess that our government must must be strict to overcome this problem especially for women and uh, children yeah thank you budia <clears throat> so dia What are you there? Mute, yeah, you not yeah. really unmute not your unmute. speaker. Your... Oh, yeah, okay, this is <laughs> yeah, oh, it always happens to me. All right, sorry. Okay, so there's a question from Usa. Usa, uh, to I think to Yuyun. Uh, yes. Does women of Papua strengthen their hair and lighten their skin since they want to be identified with the mainstream Indonesian women? Yes, uh, Usha. Thank, thank you for for the question. I guess, um, like all of the um, women that is, you know, hegemonized by the um, media or the present representation of beauty standard by the mainstream media, um, Papuan women also um, would like to follow the beauty standard introduced by the uh, mainstream media in Indonesia. That is, you know, um, skinny. Uh, long hair, skin, um, sh sh straight, uh, lighter skin, etc. And um, within the the thing is that this is in terms of the uh, Papuan political context, um, it is considered a sin because they think that you know because they wanted to you know separate it from Indonesia. Um, uh, they kind of like uh, you know most of the Papuan activists said that it is not okay to follow the Indonesian beauty standard. Otherwise you become Indonesian. While um, our political goals is trying to differentiate between Papuans and Indonesian. So they kind of like within that post, uh, they kind of like really insist uh, uh, Papuan women in particular to not straighten their hair, to not you know make their skin uh, lighter, etc. Because it's kind of like really uh, kind of like um, they need to maintain their kind of like identity as Papuans. And the identity as Papuans introduced by uh, this group is dark skin and curly hair. So they need to maintain that. It's very interesting the way uh, Papuans use this kind of like strategic uh, to use the identity, but particularly uh, the physiognomy identity to, you know, to. Uh, uh, get their political to reach their political goals. So, in this sense, yeah, it's very interesting. I'm trying to look at the way you know the identity as the um, ethnic identity in particular as the um, uh, way to uh, or the, the, as the instrumental to political uh, goal of Papuans. Thank you, also, Michelle, for the question. Uh, thank you. I, let me just add one line that also because it's always women who is uh, seen as an honor uh, as a uh, you know, as a symbol of honor to maintain one's political identity or Indeed. one's ethnic identity. And that's Indeed. why women uh, cannot, uh, you know, do something which is anti-political. Just a of small course. line. Right. Yes, thank you, Usha. Yeah. Thank you, Budia. Thank you, thank you, Usha. Yeah. And you, you yes, I, I do. Do. yes, please. Okay. Now, you know, we are talking about women during COVID period and in all your presentations should relate how, how they are happening from COVID starting from transgender to the Papua New Guinea people everybody everybody should be and I am glad that only one you know Professor Sai 
had joined our group. We are really proud of you. Thank you. You have really understood the gender question. Otherwise, you know, it is not only women should discuss women's question. Unless men also collaborate, women cannot progress because, you know, the world consists of male and female. You know, so it is not only our problem, it is also men's problem. So thank you, Professor. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So kind of you. Yeah. you. Okay. And then one more. Can you respond, yeah. uh, Dr. Chandramuli, for video yeah. questions or remarks? Pardon me? Do you have, you know, a more elaborate, uh, I don't know, remarks from uh, video questions or video remarks? No, this is a very fine session. It's beautiful, excellent. No, because, I yeah, I remember, yeah. Sorry, uh, you said yeah. that uh, transgender, the transgenderism, uh, well, what I can say is that in even in Indonesia, transgenderism is still highly persecuted. Even if I mentioned earlier in the ethnic of Bugis, they have five different genders, but Gradually, uh, the three genders, which is the, we call it uh, big men, big women, and Bisu, the, the gender neutral, nor male, nor females, are disappearing, unfortunately. And a lot of study have been done to that. And one of the things is with the coming of modernity and religions. The stricter the religions, uh, you know, the more uh, queer, you know, the queer people are. Uh, persecuted even in in because this this ethnic uh, mostly live in uh, rural areas instead of the urban areas but yeah. in urban areas things the dynamics is completely different yeah. uh, some transgender are highly accepted but most of them are you know marginalized persecuted even there's a demand because they are considered as a sinners you know there's a demand that they they should be imprisoned, something like that. So I the picture up. is, the picture is <laughs> not that <laughs> that good in terms of you know uh, transgenderism, especially with the the more conservative uh, Islam, you know the more uh, conservative Islam, the more uh, how do you say we have more and more radicalization in terms of religion. So transgenderism is still not in a safe ground, I think. Right. Yeah, I came across terms putra and putri. Yes, putra yes. Putra refers to men. Putra refers yes, to men. Yes, true. Putri true. refers to women. Women, girls, but yeah. I had one I haven't come across. I didn't hear. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, yeah. Okay, anybody? Yes, any remarks or do you want to ask question? Oh, yeah, there's a question from Mikhfatu Rohma here on chat. Uh, hello, I'm Mikfatu Rohma, law student of the uh, 17th August University, Surabaya. And I would like, uh, she would like to ask a question to Ibu Eva and other presenters. How to stop cyber sexual assault when there is no law in Indonesia that is supportive uh, to women who are victims? And how about sexual assault prevention law in India? Is there any or still... Uh, the same problem as in Indonesia. So I guess it addresses to all the speakers here. Right, yeah. I, in India, that, there is, may I speak? Yeah. Yes, yes, in please. India, in, in India, cyber laws are there and then police are assisting and they're acting pretty fast and they're trying to arrest and they arrest the growth of uh, onslaughts. There is effort made, concerted effort is made. People are conscious of uh, the remedies available, people are conscious of the sources to approach in case there is a sort of intimidation or victimization or a sort of uh, the, uh, threat, anything. So in India, I think uh, we are in a better position to handle it. I'm not sure about Indonesia and how it is like. I think a co-panelist from India agree with me. Okay, what do you think, Bidyut and uh, maybe Usha? Yeah, what, is, what I'm trying to say is uh, efforts are there, measures mm -hmm. are there, and the mechanism is there. That's true. 
uh, yeah, I agree with uh, Professor Sundramuri. Yeah. Uh, but I have something else to tell to Dia. Yes, uh, yes, yes. You know, you said we must depend on the virtual, but virtual media also spreads the fake. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful. Technology is not neutral. Mm, yes, yes. Can use it to, to serve its own purpose. Particularly, it is hostile to women. Technology mm -hmm. is always hostile to women. So let us be very careful. Sure. So, you know, so with this, if we don't have any other uh, question, we can leave and then come back at uh, what time? Oh, Next uh, two hours from now. No, no, we, we, we have about 15 minutes. So maybe uh, Usa can have a, can answer about uh, the uh, sexual assault in India because uh, Ms. Latu Roma uh, wants to ask question about it to presenters from both India and Indonesia. Okay. So did you, uh, sorry, uh, uh, did you ask me? Uh, my name is Usha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, yeah, uh, I'm actually, I, I'm sorry, I did not introduce myself. Um, I'm actually teaching in Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU, New Delhi. So I'm into China and Chinese studies and I'm looking at gender in China and India. That's my uh, interest in both literature and society. Yeah, so I, I think uh, uh, what um, uh, Professor Chandramoli said is right in the, in the sense of there are mechanisms, but uh, most of the people don't, are not even aware about it. They don't know that such mechanisms are there. And as uh, another presenter had just pointed out that it is a, most of the time they don't come out with it. They, in fact, uh, there are cases where they, they commit suicide and the family also doesn't know that the child was suffering from these uh, uh, on, online sexual assaults. Not only uh, men, also the boys, the young boys, they are also victim of, uh, not only women, the young boys and young girls are also victim of. So I, I, the awareness is not there. I, the mechanism could be there, but the spread of awareness that such a mechanism is in place and people can go to help. So there are a lot of taboos as uh, mm -hmm. the other presenter, had also, I'm sorry, I'm uh, missing the name, but uh, she had uh, very well uh, um, presented in her uh, social media and the role of, you know, and how victims actually keep to themselves and uh, continue to suffer. As, a, as Dr. Sophia had also pointed out that likes and dislikes have become so important, not for our generation. I mean, for us, I, I don't, I'm not part of many of these things and it doesn't bother me. But then I know that perhaps it bothers my daughter's generation and they are uh, so much affected by these virtual uh, realities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Usa. Uh, Yuyun, do you have a yes. answer for the uh, questions? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Budia. I think uh, what's important now is uh, to have a uh, digital, critical digital literacy. I mean, like most of the, the millennial generation have already have their standard digital literacy that they, they can operate, they can, they can you know, um, uh, develop the network, they can uh, con ma make contact, but they somehow they do, they do not really have the critical digital literacy. That is the, the potential harm that they will receive when, for instance, when they reveal their identity. The way uh, they need to uh, manage messages that come, uh, that, that received by them from the unknown person, for instance. Now that things that needs to be, um, I think needs to be, um, develop the critical digital literacy throughout the millennial generation, I guess. I think that's all that I need to add, Budia. Yeah, thank, okay, thank you. Thank uh, you, Bu Eva. Well, uh, I think she's not, okay. Uh, she left already, I think. Uh, she left. She has, yeah, she, she has problem with the connections. Okay, I think it's uh, any question, any remarks uh, before we close the sessions? Did you? Uh, so I just I just want to give a kind of summing up. Yes. Very interesting session. And, uh, you know, it depicts the various roles of 
gender ranging from transgender to you know papua new guinea women which is really startling how similarities they are you know the mm. conditions of women are almost similar throughout the world ranging from indonesia to africa to usa canada everywhere so we, what the i was telling what is needed is world women solidarity including men we don't want to leave out the men you know both men and women require solidarity and the ecological way i was that point ecological leave way of living would lead us to fight against the covid you know that that's what i am trying to tell and so i think if we don't have any other so you know your papua new guinea women did really i make i am proud of them that they want to define their own beauty be they are not white you know uh, white skull white is beautiful that is west construction yes yes you know yeah. so, so i agree with you i agree with you ma'am we may not be beautiful yeah. we think we are beautiful that's all yeah, yeah. so i yeah. agree with you a concerted effort is to be made yes yes please a concerted effort is to be made for revolving proper ecology so that yeah. we can all live in harmony we can live in peace we can live in comfort. yeah thank yeah. you yeah thank you yeah thank you i i just follow up what you mentioned as because uh we are talking about nam and one uh, the when the when nam summit was held for the first time is acknowledging the uh the construction of uh, colonialism and the effects that it has on the uh ex colonized country then it is until now like the whiteness construction is not only about our way of thinking especially for women is always be reference to beautiful western standard of beautiful unfortunately so i guess uh and then also uh, transgenderism i suppose because uh, before the colonization came to indonesia i think the 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 traditional bugis uh, ethnic uh, welcome the five different gender and not only in that island but in java especially we have a space uh, we have a place called ponoroko where you know where boys will dress as girls and they dance uh, in a, some performances were acceptable but when colonization when the introduction of western uh, construction and especially with modernity and then more and more with the coming of a uh, you know, you know uh, uh conservatism of religion things change uh, i think uh this is something that uh highly related to the ideals of nam which is you know uh peaceful coexistence to all kind of genders i suppose all kind of women coming from rural uh, or even uh urban uh, places uh, women coming from all the walks of life i thank you everybody all presenters and all uh who are, who are in our virtual room today uh with that i conclude uh, the sessions and hope to see you again in the next sessions uh two hours from now okay uh, have a I don't know if you are having lunch or dinner or supper, <laughs> so enjoy the break. Okay, bye. -bye. I'll thank take you. Care. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, take care. Bye. Bye. Yeah, just one minute, Tia. Yes, yes, yes. One minute. One minute. Nam. Yeah, yeah. Nam also spread the concept of equal gender equality. Mm, yes, yes, yes. Because of that, and because of that, the various governments wanted to took a lot of measures to give gender equality in terms of politics, economics, leading to social empowerment, 
as I was telling you yesterday. Let us not forget the contribution of NAM and let us, you know, uh, integrate NAM, COVID, and then women's problem. Mm, yeah. Please. Yeah, yeah true. I, I yes. request all the participants, speakers of our session, let us not be parochial. Let us give a broader view in the context of NAM, because it, you know, it is NAM, how NAM has helped, mm -hmm. you know, in yes. your own way. You don't have mm. to talk about non-alignment uh, movement and all that, but how NAM has helped us. In fact, you know, uh, well, it's not time now. We leave now. So yes. write to me, I will send you you know, all those, whatever. Yesterday. Okay. Thank you. All right, yesterday so evening, bye, see you again. Yeah. Yesterday yeah. evening, there was a film in which Nam and the leaders were all shown. I became yes. quite nostalgic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking okay. at all the people who have passed into history, they have all appeared on the screen. So That's, thanks yeah. to our organizers for making it possible to come together and exchange views. And yes. also about the name and it's the purpose it served. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. I'll see you again uh, two hours from uh, now. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. In the same room. Okay. Thank you. Hi.